All right, I think we're live. Let me make sure. Okay. We're good. Sounds good. I really got to get double monitors, man. This just isn't working out. Oof. All right, let's see. All right, good. I'm in the frame. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. There was some um, scheduling issue. I was trying to make it to start at like 4.30, but it wouldn't give me the option to go minute by minute. It just gave me hour by hour. So I don't know. And the option to to adjust the minutes were, it was grayed out for me. So I couldn't uh, pick the exact time I wanted. So it just first it was 3 o'clock and then it went to 4 o'clock. So I'm sorry if you guys um, wasted any time trying to figure out what was going on. Um, just uh, I've been trying to figure out this stream thing. And I pretty much got it down pat. I just need another, like just some hardware, just to really supplement everything. Um, just so we can get better quality. My mic is good, luckily. So, I mean, I have that. Uh, let's just take a look at how many people are coming in. Okay, cool. Yeah, there's already some people uh, watching right now. Okay. It was probably you guys that were waiting uh, for me to get the stream on. Yeah, there's a few articles I want to go over. Um, I haven't even looked at them yet, so uh, it might be a little different viewing experience. Like, I haven't converted them into PDFs to sort of clean up the ads and stuff. Um, and they're really annoying, especially some of, some of the magazine or the publications that I'm going over here, like this one that I won't name, but you can see. On this website, oof. Uh, let's see how many people are in. All right. I guess I should just get started. Okay. So I I, I want to do a Q and A once if we get enough people on. Um, and that's toward the end. Obviously, uh, there's a bunch of other stuff I want to get into first. Um, if I had another monitor, I could, I could go, I could watch your, your comments in, in real time without having to move, uh, switch windows. So I'm sorry about that. Maybe I'll do this. I should do this. All right. No, that's my face. Here we go. All right, so here's the chat window. I'm still gonna have to click out of it anyway, so. Okay, so I came across this article about writing. Um, it talks about how humans invented writing four different times. So what I'm assuming is there's the uh, ancient Mesopotamian uh, uh, cuneiform writing that they found. Um, uh, back in in the Sumerian times, and I'm assuming that there were three other um, separate, uh, probably Egypt, three three other separate instances of um, them uh, discovering writing. So let's see. Uh, Five thousand years ago, thirty goats changed hands between Sumerians to record this transaction. A receipt was carved onto a clay tag about the size of a post-it. Simple geometric signs represented the livestock and purveyor. The incidents, uh, the indents of circles and semicircles denoted the quantity of exchange. Imagine how surprising people would learn. Okay, so yeah, they are talking about the, the Mesopotamian, the Sumerian version, about 3200 BC. So. Let's just talk about writing for a second before we even go deeper. Um, there were a lot of people who were historical figures thousands of years ago who were open critics of writing. 
And um, what is writing anyway? It's basically stored information that could be conveyed visually. Um, and I think that includes all kinds of not just languages, coded systems, um, symbols, all that stuff. Um, so writing is basically a representation of abstract thought into the three-dimensional world. Um, now, the, people talk about telepathic stuff, um, psychic e energy and psychic ability. I'm not, that t that's not writing. Writing has to be transcribed. Like, there's a reason why they call it transcribed. It has to be moved from the abstract or from your head onto the parchment, paper, uh, concrete, whatever it is the mode of, um, of, or the actual thing that's being written on. So five, only 5,200 years ago is the Mesopotamian, when the earliest writing from the Mesopotamians called cuneiform. Um, if you guys don't know what cuneiform looks like, it's basically, I'm, I'm sure everybody here knows what cuneiform looks like. It's like triangles, like chicken scratch almost, but in, um, in a very uh, ordered way, I, I would suppose. So it's very organized. So that's the earliest form of writing. Um, now, there were open critics of writing and people who had strong opinions against writing, one of whom was Socrates. Uh, Socrates thought that um, there's, it was too risky to write things down because those ideas that are originally the writers, unless... The, unless they're being fed information, but presumably, the, let's call it the author. Um, if, if you have a thought and you write it down, you are the author, it came from you. So as you were writing it down, you had a pretty good understanding of what you were thinking and what you wanted. Um, although writing is a poor, it ca even for the author, it's not a good, um, it doesn't transmit feelings very accurately. It's the best thing we have, but a lot of stuff gets lost in translation, so to speak, or in transcription. Um, so Socrates was talking about that. He said it's a very limited form of communication. Um, there's really no reason to uh, uh, educate people using writing. Uh, he Obviously, we call it the Socratic method for a reason, where it's basically an open forum and a Q&A uh, live debate, almost. Um, that's why a lot of the works that you see from Plato um, uh, Aristotle, Socrates himself, uh, Demosthenes, they were all dialogues um, because they were basically written transcriptions of what was going on in the room. Um, now, I don't know if the writers were live in the room, but or if they just it was hearsay after the fact, they wrote it down after the fact, I don't know. Um, I should know that, I think. I think I'm pretty sure the answer's out there. I just don't know off the top of my head. But, um, yeah, Socrates was a huge critic. He thought it was too risky. And the ideas the original author had, they may not 100% get passed on. So um, let's talk about, like, Mein Kampf or something or some sort of, or, like, the, the Manifesto of the Unabomber or some sort of um, uh, controversial writing. Now, someone could take that, like, or oh, the Communist Manifesto is perfect. So Karl Mar Marx and um, the, the other guy, I don't remember his name, they write, uh, they come up with uh, the manifesto. And um, that obviously has been, co t those ideas have been received by other people, but they might have gotten a different distorted message. They may have perceived that message differently, and then they went and did something else, completely not what the original author intended. So that's what uh, that's basically in a nutshell what Socrates was warning about. Um, things there's miscommunication. There is uh, a lot of risk involved in doing this. You might cause a lot of you might cause more harm than good. Um, I don't think he thought that about just passing notes to each other. I don't know. I, um, or if he just condemned all writing. Period. But as an institution and as the backbone of a society and something that supplants um, a face-to-face -face con conversation um, was a no-go for Socrates, basically. Uh, so that's probably why writing has only goes back 5,000 plus years. 
um, that we know of. So um, it wouldn't surprise me though if there were they find some sort of writing even further back in into the Pleistocene. So back, way deep into uh, the Ice Age, I wouldn't be surprised because they had a, they had a lot of unique architecture and they they had religion they had all these other things they had uh even navigation uh they had boats back 42,000 years ago so and when i say they i mean um our ancestors uh the homo sapiens before us thousands and thousands of years before us before the younger dryas um if at okay let's just say atlantis existed just for the sake of this argument um if Atlantis existed and it was all it was cracked up to be like this huge um, metropolis with all like they had everything down pat they had all these crazy abilities to of abundance um, of satiating that human curiosity all that stuff they were super advanced they probably had some sort of writing or, or coding or some sort of system beyond speaking to each other face to face so if that if that's the case and let's just get rid of the atlantis example now if there was an advanced civilization like that then yeah it wouldn't surprise me there would be some writing somewhere the problem is writing is usually done on paper or something organic unless they had computers or something and and, and if that's the case and that's gone forever um i think if it's digital but i don't think i don't think it was digital back then there's no evidence supporting that so i have to assume that they're using paper or if they carve something in stone, but if they did carve something in stone, um, we really wouldn't be able to date it super accurately. So the only thing I can think of is the Sphinx, but there is no, or the pyramids, but there is there's no carvings in there. Uh, it's just it's just w what it is, um, or it actually didn't look like what it does today. It wasn't the face of a man; it was a lion. So um, yeah. I guess the only two things that I can think of that go back before 12,000 years ago <laughs> were those things that didn't have anything etched on it. So I think I just killed my argument right here. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, let's uh, get back into this article because I think it, I can already see it covers a lot of uh, different stuff. So uh, it begs the question, how was writing invented? That question has a, at least four answers because writing was independently invented at least four times in human history. In ancient Mesopotamia, what we just talked about 5,200 years ago, Egypt, China, and Mesoamerica. The scripts uh, of these civilizations are considered pristine or developed from scratch by societies with no exposure to other literate cultures. Okay, this is a big, 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 big claim. If you're a ling linguist, then one of the principles uh linguists go by is th there are language families and there are families th there are languages out there that have nothing to do with each other but most of the linguists i've talked to um they've talked they've basically said everything of relevance comes from indo-european um so, and i guess in a way he's right uh but he didn't say that there were uh, no other organically unique um, grassroots, so to speak, languages that weren't that had no influence from other cultures ahead of them linguistically. Uh, he said that wasn't out of the ordinary, although they are going extinct, like uh, maybe some of the, the in indigenous tribes, like that tribe in Sentinel Island that killed the American. Um, and maybe some tribes in New Guinea and in the Amazon as well. Uh, but anyway, so this is incredible. So chi so chi Chinese, Egyptian, uh, the uh, Sumerians, and the Mesoamericans, they all had their own unique script. China, I could definitely see. If you just, look at, just look at it. Um, it looks way different. Egypt and Mesoamerica, I feel like, could be related, though. Um, but anyway... Uh, let's continue before I start rambling. Um, all the writing systems are thought to be modeled after these four, or at least after the idea of them. Uh, with future research, the number of pristine scripts could decrease if archaeologists find evidence that any of these cultures, that any of these cultures 
copy the idea of writing from one another, most likely Mesopotamia and Egypt because geography. Yeah, um, yeah, Mesopotamia and Egypt are right; in, they're next door neighbors. So it's really, it's really hard to see how they were um, completely different scripts, unless one is way older and was at one point inaccessible to the other um, for a while until until their um, them being neighborly, I guess, wasn't a thing until recently. Uh, and the number could grow if other ancient symbol systems are deciphered and proven to represent true writing. But as it stands, most scholars believe that these four scripts had independent origins. Okay, so it's still up in the air um, uh, whether these four scripts really have nothing to do with each other. Maybe they all had something to do with each other at one point far, far away in the past. But I don't know. I think I tend to think that especially Chinese, man, that one, that's complete, so different from, from the Western uh, Indo-European script. Um, it's incredible. Okay, the steps to true writing, true writing systems, these graphic symbols to represent speech unambiguously. This is the stuff I was talking about like 10 minutes earlier. They allow literate people to write anything they can say and have it read just as intended. Long before true writing, people recorded ideas and information in other ways. For instance, they drew pictures to depict events or use tallies to keep count of current affairs. Yeah, I guess numbers count as languages. Yeah, you're conveying. Yeah, 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 definitely. And today, long after the emergence of true writing, there are alternative systems like musical notation, mathematical symbols, and the cartoon instructions for building IKEA furniture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, these systems convey certain concepts more efficiently or effectively than writing could, but they're limited to particular kinds of inf information uh, that we don't... Yeah, that's true. Like, um, There's only so much you can do with the stick figure. Um, you can't really record the details of what the stick figure is talking about, like especially if, he, if he's talking about something abstract. Um, Without language, it's hard to write down exactly what he's say to get into like real specifics. Um, yeah, here's an example of the, this is exactly IKEA furniture. Yeah, um, yeah. So this I, this example, the 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 IKEA example, is very close to what they were uh, using before. Um, they were it was more broad, uh, although with this. Uh, with IKEA, obviously, they they can get as specific as building this specific desk or bookcase, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, so this is where this is true writing, I guess, that intention to transcribe and literally give what you're thinking to someone else without uh, talking to them about it with your mouth. Uh, the revolutionary idea to have signs that represent speech arose in distinct cultures and at different times, around 3200 BC in Mesopotamia and Egypt, around 1200 BC in China, and around 400 BC in Mesoamerica. Although the history of these scripts differ, they underwent broadly similar developmental stages. Now, now I know for sure that these numbers aren't, um, they're, they're not set in stone. Uh, 400 BC in Mesoamerica is way, that seems way later because although th that is the evidence i guess like the hard evidence these these dates they only go by completely undisputable um dating and the people who make that decision as a consensus they if there's an idea that they don't agree with in the face of evidence they kind of have a hard time adjusting unless they are the ones themselves doing it um but the reason why i think that's uh, t uh, 400 BC seems a little bit late. That's only a t uh, 2,400 years ago. That's really not that long ago uh, when you compare it to the other civilizations. But that I, the reason why I think that is because of the Incan heads, the or the um, not the Inca, the Olmec heads. They they don't know how old those things are, and they don't know how they got there. Um, and they're they're oh, they're pretty for as old as they are. They're pristine. So if they must have had some sort of writing or something if they could do that. We just haven't found it yet. And the thing about part of the reason why the dates in the new world are so low, there's a lot of reasons. But one reason is when when the Spanish went down there and the 
like the the Spanish conquistadors, uh, the Portuguese, uh, the Dutch, when, when they all got down there in France, they torched everything in the name of Christianity. Like they, a lot of stuff did not survive. A lot of genetics were did not pass. So, and not just them. Like the the diseases they brought. Um, it's it's not a it's not hard to see that it was trunk their their history was truncated. Um, there are a lot of those. Uh, I a, a few vi uh, men. Like maybe four or five months ago, I did a video about um, them, the scientists scanning uh, using laser, I think it's LIDAR. There we go. They're using LIDAR to, to map out the ground in Colombia, Peru, uh, other parts of Northwestern, um, South America, and deep into the Amazon as well. Uh, the Part of the reason why they don't know anything about especially that area is because there's so much overgrowth but with lidar they're able to map at least at the very least get past all the canopy and map out the ground and as they map out the ground they saw all these different cities that must have been home at one point to millions of people like they had civilization down and they were successful enough to to support a population of that size so it's if they must have a way richer history than this this date that they have. And if they didn't have a written language like an alphabet in Lat like the Latin alphabet, then they must have had something like these either hieroglyphics, these symbols, or they must have had some sort of mathematics with numbers because they had the calendar and then they had knowledge of the stars. Those things don't become significant to you as a civilization unless um, you have the ability to let other people know somehow. And it's not just like them nudging and pointing at the sky. I mean, there's only so much you could communicate with that. They must have had to... There must be so many things they must have communicated in order to get everybody on board that what they were saying was truth. And that seems really hard to do if you don't have a, a lang some sort of language, even, and I'm throwing mathematics in there, like these representations of numbers. Uh, let's take a look at how many people are here and make sure my stream is still up. I hope you're, you're doing well. Yes, I'm doing very well right now. Uh, the stream has been going on for 23 minutes. Um, how many people are watching? All right, two people watching, nice, nice. I'm glad somebody is watching. Um, okay. So anyway, I went off on that uh, late date. Okay. The oldest surviving texts come from very specific contexts, such as economic transactions in Mesopotamia and divination rituals in, Ch in China, like uh, the I Ching. Uh, the first characters were mainly pictographic signs, depicting exactly what they referred to. For example, in ancient Chinese script, fish was represented by a picture of a fish. Some signs were also borrowed from pre-existing symbolic symbols, such as emblems, tokens, or pottery motifs, which people are already familiar. So yeah, take anything around your your environment and try to make a written representation of it in the 3D universe, and then pass it off as whatever you, you want it to mean. That's probably how it started. Um, and this is this is early cuneiform, like. Uh, it became less iconic and more stylized over time. So they were supposed to be rough, um, I guess just a quick way to, to communicate these ideas. So head, instead of drawing a head in this brow here, that eventually turned into um, the less iconic version of it, maybe like a couple lines. Um, it's very interesting how it evolved. You can even see the evolution of people 5,000 plus years ago. Um, and this is the sun, so you can see the horizon. So day, this is what it means for day. Interesting. And then each year it just goes down the list here. So awesome. The fish sign got gradually less fishy, ultimately assuming its present day form. This thing, a cross box with a hook on top and four dashes radiating below. This is incredible. So, yeah, in Chinese, horse 
just became this, the simplified script. It became ma, ma, as I use it, ma. <laughs> I don't know. I think that's how you say it. And then I know ma means means horse because in Korean horse is mal. So mal. I don't know if I'm saying it correct, if I'm aspirating it correctly. <laughs> but yeah. So that's really interesting. And they think they know that happened with the Roman alphabet as well. Um, and uh, the Greek uh, alphabet. Uh, in another pivotal step, some characters came to signify sounds rather than distinct, complete words. Though the degree and pace by which phonetic symbols replaced whole word signs differs between the scripts. This transition was aided by the rebus principle. Swapping a word that's difficult to depict graphically for its homonym, such as using the picture of an eye to represent eye. Uh, to help differentiate characters with multiple meanings, the systems also added semantic markers that denoted parts of speech and context clues. Yeah. So that's where the semantics come in, right? Um, to really get to, to break down to, to what the written meaning was, um, they had some sort of indicators to fill in the context so the reader or the receiver of the information could adjust their interpretation accordingly. Um, yeah, the rebus principle. I forgot about that. Oh, let me make sure my... Is my stream working? Okay, good. My picture is working. Oh, good. So, so they, so you guys can see this progressed. Um, I guess this step by step. Uh, what do you, what you would call this progression of writing? So it starts off very uh, proximitous. So anything around you, you want to get on the paper, and then once that's established over a few generations, let's say. It just warps. The same can be said with uh, writing. I mean, not writing, uh, spoken language as well. Like we have slang, we have shortcuts, we have dialects that our generation speaks way differently than, let's say, our great-grandparents' generation. And that's a really short amount of time. That's, what, 100 years, right? So every 100 years, the, the speech is probably way different. I watched a video the other day um, I forgot the title of it. I don't want to play. I don't want to get pulled. But it's called, um, I think it's called How All the Presidents Sounded. Not all of them, but just the ones, like the earliest one. I think the earliest one was like Grover Cleveland or something like that. No, it wasn't Grover Cleveland. It was someone else. I don't know. But they sounded, like when you see the progression, it's crazy. Even JFK. JFK sounds way different. That al Although that is um, kind of a regional thing as well. But still, like he has a, Everybody can, I think everybody over the age of 30 can n knows that when JFK speaks, they know that's JFK. Um, anyway, so yeah, that, that, so this, this whole language and whether it's written or spoken, it's still a mystery that a lot, a lot of scientists ha are studying, but they have not figured out completely. Um, there, there are all kinds of new theories that come up all the time. Um, some people think it's genetic too. I think definitely the capacity for it is genetic, but um, I don't think a white person would say one thing in a vacuum and another person would say a different thing in a vacuum. I don't think that has anything to do with uh, genetics at all. Anyway, um, that's all controversial stuff. So through centuries of innovation, the scripts eventually advanced to the point of transcribing speech. This propelled writing infinitely beyond its original functions into a tool capable of recording history, literature, and messages, all the content filling our libraries, notes, and text files today. So, um, yeah, I was just talking about this. Uh, there's always some sort of in innovation. There's always uh, things that are more complicated. Down, if you're, especially if you visualize things um, exponentially instead of just a linear in a line, um, writing is or just ex expressing yourself verbally or um, or uh, on paper in writing, it gets, it just expands, it branches out off of one another. It's almost like a bacteria almost. It, it's uh, interesting. I, if you were, there was this visual that I saw one time uh, that, that, um, that compared both different, uh, <clears throat> how ideas propagate and how bacteria or viruses propagate. It's very similar. Like if you were to draw it out and illustrate it into like a diagram. 
Oh, I wish I could find that graphic. I don't remember where I saw it from. Um, okay, so adopted and modified by neighboring cultures, these scripts persisted over a millennium. While the, the systems of Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Mesoamerica eventually died out, the Chinese system has remained in continuous use for more than 3,000 years. Uh, yeah, chi the Chinese script, That's especially in the case of China, they had their own script, or they inherited it from someone, or some god, some other civilization, something. They had this script, and then eventually once it started branching out more and more and through as time went on you had neighboring countries adopting it because they didn't have one it's like um pe like people who use iphones in africa the iphone didn't come from africa they didn't invent it it went like it went it was invented somewhere else and then it came over there so the koreans let's say they didn't they use the chinese script because they didn't have writing before that they may have had a, a verbal, or maybe they may, ha may they may have had a very prim primitive local writing system before they got that Chinese influence. But if you look into history, China, I mean, Korea was a tributary state to China for a long time. And if you're paying essentially taxes to to another country, then you're probably gonna have to adopt their laws to some extent. And laws are written down, and you got in order to understand the laws, you got to be literate. So, they, <laughs> the Chinese basically made their, the people immediately around them, uh, use their script and obey their laws. And it it was just like that. But there was no other alternative for them. They didn't have a strong enough writing system, um, where, where they could just be uh, linguistically independent. They didn't have that. Japan was the same way. They have uh, two different. Eventually, Korea and China they they branched off and and um, use their own. Like Korea, they use Hangul, which is five hundred years old, I think. Between four to six hundred years old. It's not that old at all. Maybe seven hundred years. Um, and it's just a simplified version of uh, what they were what they were verbally speaking before. Uh, the, Ch the Koreans never spoke Chinese. I just want to get that out there. I'm just talking about writing systems. I'm not talking about um, verbal, verbally. The Koreans always had the Korean language to so or their own language. They never spoke Chinese. Um, that's their official language. Japanese, same way. And, they, and the, Chinese, the Chinese and Japanese, they have traditional scripts. Uh, I think in J Japanese it's called kanji. And then they went to hiragana. And then in Korean, uh, it was Hanja, which is the, the Chinese script. And then Hangul is the one they use now. Um, so it was very interesting. And I think there are other, I'm not sure about Vietnam and the Khmer Empire. Uh, I think they had their own thing. Or, or at one point they were um, the Chinese. Uh, user, uh, they had to use the Chinese script. Oh, but anyway, so that's pretty much it for this article. Um, they think, I think it's kind of, they didn't really tell us anything new. They just, I think it's just more of a speculation thing where maybe the dates are so shaky that maybe the Mesopotamians weren't the first ones to invent it. There were probably, uh, people ahead of them. And like I said earlier, if there was an advanced civilization, um, then they probably had some sort of writing as well. They must have. I think. Uh, let's check the stream real quick. Let's check the comments. Uh, no new comments. All right. At least I'm still online. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Let's go to the next one. That was um. Uh. Okay. Here's one from Popular Mechanics. This caught my eye. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. It's called. Uh, AI predicts humans have an ancestor we don't even know about yet. Um, Neanderthals and Denisovan cousins likely formed a new species, and AI says that muddies human evolution even further. Man, okay, so this is another one of those AI, um, those AI derived articles where they talk about the we got to consult the AI and see what the AI thinks. But AI is such a blanket term; we don't know exactly how. Like this isn't like a what you would expect like from a movie like a brain in a freaking box somewhere that 
is way more advanced than humans. No, I think it, it just means that it, it goes through processes faster and it can compute and make simulations really quickly. Um, so if, if that's the case, then just running simulations, I mean, it is definitely, you, you have to take it with a grain of salt, I guess, or I do anyway. Some people put more credence into it than others. Um, I, I don't really, like, I wouldn't use it as, as a, I wouldn't build an entire argument from AI evidence, but let's just read this and see what it has to say. Okay, this is from Popular Mechanics. Uh, yeah, just Popular Mechanics. So, using artificial intelligence, a number of European evolutionary biologists now believe that humans have an a ancient ancestor whose identity is unknown to modern science. The ancestor based out of Asia. Okay, they're talking about Denis Sobens. So, so I did a video on this that. It was my most successful video, by the way, uh, a, a, br a crossbreed between Neanderthals and Denny Sylvan, a Neanderthal woman and a Denny Sylvan man. So now the conversation, that was six months ago. So now the conversation has sort of carried and progressed. And now they think they, there's a link between them, like some a completely new ancestor that we have and a descendant of them. So... Denny Sylvan and Neanderthals, they go way back. The furthest, I think Neanderthals go back 800,000 years? Something like that? Maybe even more? 1.2 million? I, I don't remember off the top of my head right now. Um, but some, it's not that long ago. Uh, it's within a million years. Let's just say that. Around, in or around within, inside a million years. Um, Neanderthals were thought to, to inhabit some parts of the Middle East and uh, Europe. Uh, especially Eastern Europe and and Western Europe, like Spain, um, where the Celtic people were. Uh, and then the Denisovans were more in Siberia and the Tibetan Plateau, um, the Caucasus, uh, uh, part, or the Steppe, rather, and uh, China around there. Um, so if you guys don't know really quick, Denisovans were discovered in 2008. Now they've gone so far as put it on par with uh, um, Neanderthals as some of the uh, subspecies of archaic human. Uh, the consensus was that the groups were genetically independent from each other. They also likely both crossbred with modern humans. And that's true because we have some of their DNA. Some people have upwards of, what, 2%, 2.3%. I mean, that's a significant amount, I think. At one point, if you go way back, it's basically like a timeline. It's a timekeeping thing. So if we go back far enough... That's a lot of DNA, uh, or a lot of a large percentage of people had that DNA, uh, of our people had Neanderthal DNA. So that exactly means we crossbred with them, and Denny Sylvan as well. Uh, but when researching the demographic species of nearly 800,000, yeah, I was right, 800,000 years ago. So not even inside a million. Uh, scientists have struggled with their complexity. That's where AI comes in. Uh, okay, so let's talk, here's where we hear more about the AI. So scientists trained an algorithm to learn to predict human demographics using genomes obtained through hundreds of thousands of simulations. Okay, yeah. So it's a simulation generator, basically, uh, based on some real evidence, obviously. Uh, real numbers, rather. Oscar Lau, principal investigator to Centro Nacional de Análisis Genómico, and an expert in this type of simulation in a press statement. Whenever we run a simulation, we are traveling along a possible path in the history of humankind. Of all simulations, deep learning allows us to observe what makes the ancestral puzzle fit together. So deep learning algorithm. Okay, got it. Um, these simulations point toward a Neanderthal Denisovan ancestor. Okay. While it seems like a large assumption for an algorithm to make, evidence is growing in its favor. Last August, fossils were announced that showed the first time a genetic hybrid. Yeah, this is what I, this is a video I did uh, between the two species: a female who lived ninety thousand years ago with a Denisovan father and Neanderthal mother. Uh, scientists generally agree that Denisovans and Neanderthals likely would have mated when the opportunity presented itself. Of course, if there is a, it's a the conditions are right, it's going to happen. Uh, the only problem is that there appear to be far fewer Denisovans. The number of pure Denisovan bones that have been found, I can count on one hand. 
a population geneticist at the University of Washington, Seattle, who worked on the discovery of the, the Altai Mountains, the main site of any possible overlap between the populations were likely thinly populated. Yeah, um, because they had the elevation, the conditions were different. Um, but that may, the fact that they haven't found many of the Denisovans doesn't mean that there were very few. It, it could mean that they, they're so old that only that many have survived. We, like, if, if there was a super successful, let's say America existed 1.2 million years ago, and then one point, and then we disappear for some reason. If if we even found two bones, two skeletons, that would indicate, holy crap, that if you go back far enough, and if we date these far back enough, they might have come from a huge metropolis. It's kind of like the genetic thing I just talked about. We have 2% of DNA. Yeah, that doesn't seem like a lot now. But if you go back the, in the generations, in its context, we're lucky that it even it hasn't been uh, watered down yet and disappeared and, and obscured by uh, nature. So um, it's very interesting that, uh, that they even found anything in the mountains of the finger, the finger bone of the Denisovan at all. Um, our theory coincides with the hybrid specimen discovered recently in Denisova, although as yet we cannot rule out other possibilities. Uh, if more hybrids come forward, the algorithm's predictions would seem more plausible to the day. There's no guaranteeing its accuracy. Human evolution was a messy, complicated business. Still, even the possibility of a new species is a gauntlet thrown down to archaeologists and scientists who can help further unlock the secrets of humanity's past. Okay. If more hybrids come forward, like as if they're alive and they're in hiding or something. Um, yeah, AI, d depending on how you feel about AI and what they say and what it predicts, and what it thinks is the most logical thing, they, it's probably right. There's probably a bunch of humans um, back then, and in or period, there probably was a lot of uh, people who can articulate, walked on two feet, like humanoid type people who who had skin, who had bare skin. Um, so, yeah, maybe if I had to say, yeah, if, if the AI said that. Or if I didn't know the AI said that and I heard a scientist say that, that would make sense to me, for sure. And again, 800,000 years is not a long time, but it's long enough to get some human hybrids in there. Because look, human civilization as we know it, the, as we know it, where we can directly track, I'm talking about Roman Empire, uh, all the way before the pre like ancient Egypt, Sumerians, all the way to us, we can track within, well within reason. Uh, we have uh, a direct link, so to speak, from person to person, right? So his son, his grandson, his great-grandson, all, we're all connected. And then we have stuff that we find in the remote past that are not connected to us, like the boats 42,000 years ago. Uh, we don't know where that came from, who who was in power at the time. We there, There's no there's a cutoff there, right? Do you guys see what I'm saying? So that's only, what, 7,000 years tops? Right, but, or let's just call it twelve thousand years. Right after the Younger Dryas, after the Eraser event, um, eight hundred thousand years ago, that could happen a bunch of different times. If we think of if we think of our civilization's history as we know it now, let's just go back to the last when writing was invented five thousand two hundred years ago. Um, though we could think of that as a cycle. So in eight hundred thousand years, we could have that many cycles. That means think of how mixed people are now. And that didn't take that long. So Neanderthals, if there were around 800,000 years ago, and we assume that there are other humans alive at the same time that they were and sharing the same continents and the same resources, um, it makes sense that we they would run into another humanoid race. If we assume that there were other humans alive at the time, which is more and more keeps coming out that there were. Um, so... And then there's all these ancient cave paintings, like the Chauvet Caves and all that. I mean, in order to get to that level, to even write, to, have, to get someone in your civilization to write something down and depict it and have it survive, I mean, the chances of that happening are really low if the populations were super low. So, it, 
I don't know. Um, the AI, I'm, I have mixed feelings about, but that is an interesting thing to say. And there probably was a, an hybrid, a hybrid somewhere d along the line. Um, okay. Uh, missing link in human history confirmed after long debate. Huh. Okay. So did they find the missing link? Did they find Sasquatch? What's this? Looks like a fused head. Okay, this comes from CNN. Okay, let's just hear them out. Uh, early humans were still swing swinging from trees two million years ago. The fossils of Australopithecus sediba have fueled scientific debate since they were on the Malabap. Okay, okay. I think I did an article about this uh, back back in the day. So this is in South Africa. Um, they found something. So they found they had Lucy, right? Lucy was three million year old Australopithecus, um, and then they found this Homo habilis guy, and those were supposed to be like the oldest uh, precursors of human period. And then they find this person, Asa Deba, um, who might have been that link between us and Lucy. Uh, this might be an update, a follow up. So here's some context. Two partial uh, Australopith skeletons, a male and female, were found in 2008 in a cave in Malapa in South Africa. In a cave. It's called the Cradle of Humankind. Uh, so their discovery set off years of debate in the scientific community, with some rejecting the idea that they were from a previously undiscovered species with close links to the Homo genus and other floating the idea that they were two different species altogether. Uh, the new research has laid those suggestions to rest and outlined numerous features the skeletons share with the fossils of the Homo genus. Uh, also, were feet and feet, an instance showing it spend a good amount of climbing in trees. So they lived in trees pretty much, or they they lived in an environment with a lot of trees. Uh, hands have grasping capabilities more advanced than Homo habilis. Uh, the researchers in the paper highlight the remarkable story of how the fossils were found. Okay, so the first fossil of Australopithecus sediba was discovered by Matthew Berger, and then a nine, he was nine years old at the time. And, okay. So, basically, they want, they, they, they want, when he was a kid, he went and found this rock next to the cave, and then it turned out to be uh, an, a sediba. So, that must mean there are other finds in that area for sure they should just open and, and i think they have opened a huge um, excavation into the site so if this is a missing link between chimps and us um there probably is a spectrum of of links so i don't think there's just one missing link it's probably some some uh what would a mos not a mosaic but just a, a deep 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 progression from from ape like primates and us unless you think that we didn't come from them at all period and we although we happen to have even though we share genetics with them unless you're a believer that we the human form like we part of us comes from something divine um or extraterrestrial or whatever unless you believe that then yeah, we, it, maybe it was a, a progression. Maybe between maybe a hundred generations would draw you some a, a, an indistinguishable or some not indistinguishable, but maybe a different, a far enough away species that a hundred generations prior they're not the same. Um, I don't think that they found anything indicating that though. Um, so that's why they've. It's always been made for decades about finding the missing link. That was always a big, a big deal. A big deal for um, researchers was uh, if you could find the missing link, then you were well on your way to some sort of medal or something like that. <laughs> so, or prestige. Okay, so that was from CNN Health. Oh, my voice is starting to give out, guys. I'm probably gonna do, depending on this one. This may be the no. This is the writing one. Uh, okay, let's do this. Uh, okay, let's do this George Washington one. This one comes from Washington Post. Democracy dies in darkness. That what? 
Was that always their tagline? Okay, anyway. How a deadly plot against George Washington became a historical footnote. Uh, they were plotting to kill George Washington. I first saw the details in a footnote. I thought it had to be fake, something they made up on the internet. For nearly a decade, I couldn't stop thinking about it. Eventually, I started to dig, dig deeper. Historical clues suggest that in 1776, a group of British sympathizers launched a plot to kidnap Washington. That's not surprising. Uh, other evidence says the plan was to assassinate him. Either way, the reality was the same. At the start of the Revolutionary War, Washington's life was in danger. Yeah, it's war. Um, when I reached out to Pulitzer Prize winning historian Joseph Ellis, he confirmed the existence of the plot and said he was fascinated by it too. But when I told him I was thinking about writing a book about it, he warned how hard the project would be. So it was by espionage, clandestine in investigation to s stop it. Washington's inner circle's entire purpose was to ensure the secrecy of their actions. Um, yeah, he was a Freemason. So his inner circle were probably other Masons, especially when you're talking about founding a new, a country that goes against the grain of everything, of all the fucking monarchs and all the bankers and all that stuff. Um, it's, uh, yeah, you're in, you're, you're treading dan in dangerous waters there. Um, you can find the number of slaves at Mount Vernon. You'll never find all the spies by its, its nature. This is something that will always be elusive. Okay, so this guy is talking about the conspiracy against George Washington. I don't know too much about George Washington um, and his, I mean, I'm familiar with his background, but he, they found a lot of his letters, um, his diaries. That's how they knew he had slaves. And that's how they knew that he grew weed uh, cannabis. And he even talked about it, um, not just for cultivating his hemp. Like he actually smoked weed. Uh, he was a stoner and he talked about it. He talked about separating the male from the female. Um, but other than like his dealings with people, there's so many things written about George Washington and um, his his relationships that I don't know. I don't know. I can't separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, in in, in those subject lines. And uh, that's why I always like to whenever something with George Washington comes up, I want to read about it. Uh, he was right. Thankfully, as my new book, uh, the first one, blah blah blah. It all culminated with Washington rounding up those responsible, building, building a gallows and hanging one of the co-conspirators who was one of Washington's own bodyguards. Okay, interesting. In front of 20,000 witnesses, there was the largest public execution in North American history at the time. So who was responsible for the plot to kill Washington? Probably bankers, if I had to guess. So allegiance, so there's, it was probably a loyalist versus a, uh, it wasn't a patriot probably it was it was probably someone um someone like benedict arnold who used to be a patriot and then turned turned uh became a turncoat uh, as washington led his army to new york in the spring of 76 many residents feared his arrival but there were many who didn't uh like the governor of new york david matthews mayor of new york david matthews rather and then the mayor william tryon Okay, he's just going into bodyguards. Okay, so the hanging took place. Okay, he gets really into detail about what happened when he hung that guy. Okay, Friday, June 28th, 1776, the same morning that John Adams presented Jefferson's first draft of a new Declaration of Independence to the Continental Congress, and on that very same day, the British forces were about to arrive in New York Harbor and prepare their first major attack. Um, okay, so this is like right before shit hit the fan, or right after shit hit the fan, I think. Um, no, right before, that's right, right before. Uh was watching man this guy just goes on and on okay that was a waste of time this guy was just selling his book i'm sorry guys okay let's go to um well let me talk a little bit about george washington though and, and freemasonry since i did a video about freemasonry semi uh recently um so the there's a lot of stories about how the united states has started um there's what you're taught in school the Boston Tea Party, um, all that stuff, um, owning their own land, separating from the crown. Um, a lot of it had to do with uh, money as well, currency. Uh, they didn't want to deal in, they wanted their own 
uh, gold back currency, basically. Uh, that was a big de- that was a big part of it, and that's why Andrew Jackson, uh, he was the last president to have stopped the Federal Reserve from becoming a thing, and he he was the last president to have a national debt of zero. So that's the last time we were in the black with him. And there's a famous political photo of him cutting off the the three headed dragons, the three heads of the dragon, known as uh, international banking. Um, the Bank of England, rather. And a lot of people think that's conspiracy or some tinfoil hat shit. It's not. Like, th- this is, there's in there's documented proof of this. Um, I'm not going to bring it up. I don't want to spend a lot of dead, dead air just Googling stuff. But, and then eventually it came back. And now, we, uh, 1971, we got off the gold standard, and you guys know the rest of the history. Um, but George, uh, just that entire time, the forming of the United States, there's so much stuff going on and the waters have been so muddied in that subject that you have to be a real expert and have gone through with no bias at all, which is right away, very difficult. And you just want to get straight to the truth. Now there are authors like that who are out there who have done all that investigation and have done their research and, and I'm not just talking about second sources. I mean, like primary sources, and um, came to the truth themselves. Uh, the problem is I haven't uh, gone and read all that stuff, and a lot of people haven't. But anyway, that article, that Washington Post article, is weird. Like I was just trying to sell a book by talking. You just talked about the context, but he didn't really say anything about uh, that that conspiracy, except he hung some guy who might have wanted to kill him. And yeah, George. It was George Washington. He was the uh, first president. Of course, someone's going to try to kill him. There have been presidents after him who were killed, for pro- arguably by the same people. So yeah, it was probably it was probably some uh, some shady char- some organized shady characters. How about that? Okay, we can't end on that one. Um, let's do this last one here. We've been almost an hour now. All right, one more. Uh, scientists sue to protect Utah Monument and fossils that could rewrite Earth's history. So, bear. Okay, this is. This one's pretty long. But anyway, here's a map. Okay, this is all political. I don't really want to get into this. Um, but. There are. It doesn't surprise me that there are things in Utah, especially Utah and that entire mountain range, um, that could rewrite the, the history of the New World. There's always they're always finding stuff here. Um, here's a snout of a fossilized phytosaur, a crocodile-like creature that once roamed bear, bear's ears. Yeah, um, North America is a huge mystery. Um, not just because of the Younger Dryas impact, not because there used to be a giant glacier like a, a, or two, two giant glaciers that were fused together on that entire landmass um, for, a lo- for a while. And it's, uh, who knows what secrets that, that obscured because when you have a glacier that big, Anything on the ground is just being ground to dust, right? I mean, how heavy is is the Laurentide ice sheet? Gosh, I don't know. That's 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 a those are orders and orders of magnitude heavier than than the biggest heaviest buildings that we can think of. They're country sized, and in this case, in the Ice Ages case, they're they're continent sized blocks of ice. So. Um, how did it get to that point? A lot of people don't. A lot of people think it's um, basically based on the Earth, where the Earth is, and it's in its long, in the long count, and, and its and its solar, in this, in its position in the solar system relative to the sun, and uh, thus it changes uh, it changes uh, the weather. So that's why people say weather is cyclical because our or- orbit cyclical and our position in the, the Earth's position in, in the solar system constantly changes. And also it wobbles on its a- axis. There's all this other stuff going on. Uh, gravity, or the, the gravity of the Earth and then the sun's gravity on the Earth and all that stuff. 
um, and also uh, solar activity as well can affect uh, the radi the radiation and the weather. Uh, but for the most part, the t as far as temperatures go, it's pretty cyclical according to uh, some of the the most cutting edge, um, the most updated science. Uh, but Bears Ears National Monument, which I've never been to, um, dinosaurs used to live here, and that's as much as they know. <laughs> they don't know. They, they only they only have like a heart like 66 million years ago or something like that, and that's pretty much it. Everything else is pretty um, up in the air. Some people even dispute dinosaurs exist, which I don't know. I think that's 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 bubkis. I think th those big skeletons were there for a reason because they found skeletons of other things. So why wouldn't they find anything huge? Um, just because it's huge, it's made up. I don't know. It's just not enough evidence to support that. So yeah, I think dinosaurs are real. Um, but North America is probably way more ancient than everything else, and. I'm not surprised that they're finding stuff that's rewriting history here. Um, yeah, Triassic fossils coming through rocks. Uh, this is back in the 90s that they found all this stuff, and they've been working on it for 20 plus years. Um, yeah, interesting. So, anyway, um, I've gone on for over an hour now. Uh, let me know what you guys think. Um, hey, I still have one person watching. Awesome. Um, I'll probably do an, a video this weekend, and not a live stream. Uh, maybe not a live stream. Maybe I will. I don't know. Uh, but that that should do it, guys. Uh, thanks for joining me. Thanks for sticking it out. And my voice is going. So uh, I'll talk to you guys later.